you've talked about being spectacularly successful in the land of hedonistic whim, let's say, and you've discussed, well, you were kind of an icon for that, right? And and a model for that even. And so, you know, you're, 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 you're emblematic of that, of the success of that approach, but that didn't work for all sorts of reasons. And so it seemed to me that you wandered out of that landscape into a kind of amorphous mysticism, but that that's became, become more targeted and it's become more targeted in the Christian direction recently, particularly perhaps in the last year. Is all of that accurate? Yes. Is there any? Okay, that is accurate. Okay, so what do you make of the fact, and you talked about the rosary specifically just now, what do you make what do you make of the fact that that journey out in the desert of mysticism, let's say, is, is well, the things, the, I think the same thing is happening to you in some ways that's happening to people like Ayan Hirsi Ali and to Neil Ferguson and to Douglas Murray and to Tim Holland, Tom Holland and, and also to Richard Dawkins is that there's a recognition emerging that there's something in the midst of the mystic, let's say, down in the depths of the metaphysical that speaks of something that's much more Christian than any of us would have possibly imagined, let's say, 15 years ago or even a year ago, for that matter. And I'm wondering how that's making itself manifest specifically in your life. Like, how is this mysticism that's obviously part of your nature, that was probably what was pulling you at least in part in the hedonistic direction to begin with. That was somewhat desire for communion with the spirit of Dionysius and Bacchus, you know, like there's a, there's a, there's a call to self-transcendence in a kind of radical hedonism, that's for sure. And so it's just not the optimal ground, let's say. It might be better than rank cowardice, however. You know, it was William Blake who said, wisdom through excess, and there's something to be said about that. And that's also echoed in the tale of the prodigal son, by the way. It's something to wander in the vast wastelands of the hedonistic world successfully and then come home. There's something to be celebrated in that, even though you're going to pay for your bloody sins, that's for sure. Even though they may have been necessary and even desirable in some bizarre sense. So in your life at the moment, it it looks to me like you've taken a Christian tilt. Like, what the hell do you make of that? And how do you know that that's just not another form of self-aggrandizing falsehood? (laughs) Well, you know, just when you think you've thrown the the devil devil out. There he is again. All all dressed up. (laughs) (laughs) But somewhere to go. Well, you know, I see Joseph Campbell as a kind of uh, a sort of deputy to Jung's principle. And I like how uh, Campbell says, uh, in the end, you might likely explore the native ideology and theology. Now, I know that's sort of somewhat fast and loose, given that I'm in northern Europe and uh, the Nazarene was hardly springing forth from Essex Greys on the Thames side. Right, an important point to make, an important point to make. Western, it's like, yeah, not exactly. (laughs) Yes, yes. Um, How it has felt, almost as if something that felt so parochial and prosaic because of the, um, you know, because of the delivery systems of it's ordinary, it's abundant, it's these grandmas at a bus stop, it's the drab intonations of a vicar in a parish, it's the apologetic Church of England, and I'm not attacking the Church of England, but where you feel that they might almost be afraid to mention God in there for fear of stepping on somebody's toes. He's in the 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 broom closet, he's (laughs) underneath the mop. (laughs) Yes, definitely. (laughs) So, uh, because because it felt so, it felt so sort of you know local. Like this figure of Christ, what it's like, what it's felt like is, oh, it's you. He's always been there. He's always been there. There is something in this that is not that, as you obviously are exploring as well as rather beautifully 
uh, illuminating for us. There's something in these texts that is about inducing states. And as whenever a ultimately a rational idea I issued through language, in poetics, you know, through, through poetics, when you induce a state beyond what is literally encoded, when you invite somehow that you reach beyond what is presented linguistically, it, it, it seemed to me somehow that in returning to this, in returning to the Bible, in returning to Christ, indeed, it does feel like a return, doesn't it? Rather than a, a novel discovery issued at the shore by a missionary who doesn't know whether he's going to get a pat on the back or a cauldron to swim in at high temperatures. It's felt to me like this has always been here. This has always been here. I'm of course enjoying C.S. Lewis's approach because I am a product of uh, cultural atheism, materialism, hedonism, and yes, a, 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 a child as much of Jim Morrison as William Blake of like that. This is about the Dionysian, the Bacchanalian. This is about empowerment, sex magic, the glory of it all, the abundant glory, throwing off the liminal and the limiting and of course then one arrives one day at the terrible conclusion that there's nothing there and and perhaps only then indeed yeah, that's well, why Jim it, Morrison died right at 27 which seems to be the fate of many many um enthusiastic back in alien geniuses for really, surely right? for sh for surely there must be a death for surely there must be a death hopefully you don't have to kill the host hopefully the death is merely the idea and what is offered, uh, and one thing I feel, as you know from our previous conversations, that I have at least a kind of experiential authority to speak about, while not representative authority, is the impact of the 12 steps on the psyche of an addict and its analysis in the f uh, uh, ultimately that what addiction represents is a spiritual problem, is a spiritual quandary, and even embedded in the idioms like get off my face, lose lose myself, get smashed, is the idea that what the actual impulse is, and indeed think how significant the word craving is within addiction, is a move towards, a pulling, some force, some source, some calling, some clarion call, some harbinger, awaiting some personal rapture. The problem is, of course, living as we do in these the, uh, the a context that ultimately offers you as the end goal through materialist and rational analysis that you might become just this type of a person in this type of a society. Something important is lost, and those things are uh, explicit in the texts that undergird 12-step practice and philosophy. It is plain that they are talking primarily about, and I've said to you before, but I'll say again, that Jung was a key influence on the founders of that movement, along, along curiously, along with first-century Christianity. That what that they are not saying, you know, give up drinking, give up drugs. They are saying, give up self, give up self give up self. Uh, there are phrases like abandon yourself to God completely. Like after they get past the well, it's not going very well, is it? All this drinking and drug use and even indicated in the earliest literature for these groups is the idea that there will be behavioral expressions, that there will be sexual behaviors, there will be promiscuity, etc. And God alone. And, and, and if you maybe even just take that as one thread and consider what the 70 years since this piece of folk philosophy was all good in the world of pornography, something that was once of course available but somewhat abstract and now is normalized, immersive, immediately available. It's it seems that the environment is encroaching. And this reminds me of something sort of important I want to say. Of course, anyone that explores it, it is, the reason the prodigal son is important is because, <laughs> like, if someone goes, if someone's telling you you don't want to be doing any of that, and it seems that it's born in prurience and an inability, an inability to attract mates, well, what's the value of that testimony? But someone that's come back from there and says, well, give it a try, but it didn't work very well for me, it is, uh, I think, is a more powerful 
your uh, testimony to deliver. At least it seems to me that, 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 that certainly that is the testimony that, that has affected me more. But what is difficult to avoid, I feel, Jordan, is the sense that not only is there this, you know, and you, it's something you touched upon earlier. You said, no, it's not only force, you know, and, and I sort of offered you that perhaps the ben benevolence that this force has issued but could be, and this is of course reductive, an inadvertent side effect of, the, uh, of ty tyranny. And please be aware that I am apprised of the fact that the forms of tyranny that are emerging now, apparently in opposition to these old school not to be repeated, let's face it, militaristic, demagogic, populist, strongman forms of tyranny that we're being continually warned of are far more terrifying. The Kafkaesque, bureaucratic, banalized, invisible, dreadful, we're here to help, I'm afraid your inquiry can't be heard. This is diabolical. Huxley's hell terrifies me even more than Orwell's, although pl plainly we're in some amalgam with a uh, beautiful gilding from Kafka in the sort of unknowable quality. Where is the judge? What is the trial? Who's doing all this stuff? And it seems to me that there must be, e even if we are to say it's about power, even if we are asking, who is it an internal struggle? Is it my power over my instincts and the expression of those instincts in, in, in conjunction with culture that I might call self over time? There's seems to be some other agent. There does indeed seem to be a serpent. There do indeed appear to be fallen angels. There do indeed appear to be ulterior forces at work. For I am struck that when I was an emblem of this culture in my hedonism, I was gloried and made much of. And when I say there is something else, we must move towards God. This is when the culture comes alive. This is when the spotlight shines. This is when the knock at the door comes. This is when forces are marshaled. It seems to me that something, someone must have been telling lies about Joseph K.